Hello everyone, this is just a quick update. I'm busy working on a more concise, more um, refined series of explanations and proofs of to what is happening and why it's happening. Uh, but that's actually taking more time and I'm finding there's so much more research out there that I have not actually come across. So uh, it's the time I get, that, get through all this, I will have missed some of these dates. So I want to actually um, announce these dates in advance uh, based on what I know at this point in time these dates won't change but uh, the degree of evidence and proof I can present as to why these things are happening well I can obviously present in a better way uh, sometime in the future but at the moment I just want to get these dates out what I'd like to first show is uh, what has actually happened so far and as you can see if we pull up the log of energy you can see we've actually hit all these dates that I talked about previously okay so let's pull up uh, Let's see, Moon Alanin was one of these. We had that back in July 6. And then we also had a peak on the Moon Alignment, alignment which was on August 17. Okay, and this alignment didn't really happen around August 3rd, as I mentioned before, because uh, Alanin was at the same distance from the Sun as the Earth was from the Sun. So there's no energy to be uh, dispersed at that time. Okay, so what else have we got? We've got. Uh, Following that will be the Jupiter alignments, and of course Jupiter is where we discharge energy. As you can see here on August 20, we had a big discharge of energy, and I believe it was August 22nd you got this other thing which was in Virginia. Okay, so when you had that earthquake in Virginia, it was actually it's also felt in Washington, and there's a massive discharge of energy. And if you want an example of actually what happened. Well, this is it. This is a very clear example of what we're looking at. The phenomenon we're looking at is the electrical phenomenon. Uh, this is the Washington Monument, and you would ask yourself why they've got a helicopter up there looking uh, for um, damage at the top of the monument. And we also had damage at the top of this um, marble structure here. Washington Mon Monument is made of the marble, which is a, a crystalline rock, a carbonate. Rock. What you're looking at here is damage done to the top of Washington Monument. As you can see, one of the marble blocks has been cracked, and that was cracked not by the movement of the earthquake, obviously. That was cracked by the energy coursing through this 555-foot um, tall monument, which I have to do more research, but uh, as I understand it, I think it's down to bedrock, and it's 111 feet below the surface. So do the math on that. Okay, let's pull up the next one, which is this what well, I've been labeling Planet X, and I'm going to have to change that. I have now discovered that uh, it might not be Planet X. I have more information as to where Planet X would be, and it, it's actually the other blacked out area in Google Sky. Not surprising. Um, okay, so this is going to be an unknown. I don't know what that is out there. I think it might be uh, maybe the trail that comets tend to take. These long period comets might actually all take this trail and this might be just an alignment formed by this endless trail of comets going off to the edge of the solar system and back off out towards Orion and then round to Leo so this is going to be relabeled uh, unknown in spite of that on this alignment on this uh, this Pleiades alignment we do have all these events including the March 11 earthquake in Japan and the reason that occurred is because we had the energy coming from the Sun coursing out to Comet Alanin, we pass through that uh, that line of energy. The Earth was electrified, and we discharged on this alignment, uh, which is like a, a grounding effect. When the Earth Moon aligned with this point uh, towards the Pleiades, there's a it seems to discharge. So it's to what the object is. Uh, like I say, I think it's a a line of comets that have gone out in that direction and they're tail to tail to tail so it's like a, a wire the ultimate grounding wire okay and that's what I think we're discharging onto when we hit that alignment okay after that alignment of course you've got the Orion alignment and I believe that's where the dead sun is okay the dead sun I'm not sure if that's coming in or what more accurately I think the dead sun is what we the whole solar system revolves around I don't know what the cycle of it is it could be 24,000 years it could be 12,000 years uh, but it's a, it's a long cycle and at this point in time there's no way to know really um, at what stage we are in the cycle. I do know that we uh, possession has been accelerating 
but at this point in time with, with the recent pole shifts and I've got information coming about that but with the recent pole shifts we've had um, there have been small pole shifts but up to 5 degrees and you haven't heard about it but I've got evidence to support that but with these recent pole shifts there's no way to measure what the true precession amount is because the sun is not rising in the same place after these major earthquakes we're moving two degrees here, two degrees the other way we're not following the precession cycle at all that was a cycle that carried on since the days of Ptolemy and uh, we've broken out of that cycle and possibly because of the arrival of Elenin but possibly because uh, we're in the vicinity of or Planet X is, is in our near vicinity um, that's something I have to do more research on because I think that's the next most imminent thing would be the arrival of Planet X, uh, Nibiru which as far as I understand is in the constellation of Virgo um, so that's the blacked out area in Virgo that's Planet X uh, that seems to be the most likely candidate and could explain some of the other anomalies I've seen so far in these uh, charts that I've got so that requires more research for my part to say whether I think that is correct or not and as to its scheduled date of arrival um, yeah it requires more research we're just going to have to find all the information we can and time is limited I think we only have a couple of weeks uh, before we lose the internet so um, we have to get through this information as quickly as possible and then get it on paper okay so what comes after the dead star alignment well that's uh, it's going to be the sun moon alignment that's coming up in a couple of days it's going to be on uh, August 29 there's not going to be a big event I believe on that I think I'll notice a charging of the earth and the charging of the earth event will be reflected in these clocks that I've got uh, the clocks, I now understand how that principle works. Uh, it's the quartz. The quartz, as, it, as the earth charges, the, the charges is absorbed into the quartz crystals. The quartz crystals expand. As an object expands, its resonant frequency, frequency uh, is lowered. For example, if you have a small bell, it rings at a high frequency. You make a bigger bell, it rings at a low frequency. The quartz crystals are resonant frequency devices. They resonate. Um, with a pulsed signal coming into them, they have a fixed resonant frequency. But of course, as the size of this, as the quartz expands, its resonant frequency is reduced. So the clock speed slows. That's exactly what's going on. Uh, as far as what happens after the discharge event, the reason the clocks not only jump back but perhaps overshoot the mark, in my opinion, is because the discharge, just like after a lightning discharge, and this is essentially the same thing as a lightning discharge but it's on a cosmic scale all the electrons, I mean, I'll assume it's electrons, are being pulled to another part on the planet there's a massive deficit of electrons at the my location here where I've been observing this uh, phenomenon of the slowdown of the clocks so the clocks jump back up, They've actually the crystals shrink as they shrink they resonate at a higher frequency they run faster until uh, everything stabilizes back to normal and then they carry on at uh, undisturbed at a flat rate so that is what's going on with the quartz crystals I can, I've got lots of evidence to prove that's the case but um, again that's going to have to be in a future video right so <coughs> the uh, sun moon alignment is not going to be a big event but I think it's going to be a, a charging event of some sort um, but we're not really going to see much on that what did we see on the last one? We, we did see a bit of a spike on July 31st, so perhaps something about the same as that will be coming up in the, in the next two days. Uh, but I, it's not one that's easy to predict, and it's not one that's probably going to be significant. Coming up next is a large one, and that would be the Earth-Moon alignment is pointing towards Elenin. Uh, I expect we will have a bit of a surge, at least as large as the July 6th, because this spike is going to occur on uh, September 1st, so after that comes the Jupiter alignment and Jupiter alignment will be a significant discharge event it will be charging up on the alignment with uh, Alanin and then two days later we hit the Jupiter alignment and we'll have a discharge event and I should be able to give you the exact time of that discharge event so we'll do that right now uh, we're looking down on the solar system and here's the Earth, here's Alanin the tail is pointing away from the sun as it always does but where our earth moon alignment is pointing towards the sun so we should be on a slight charge cycle and in fact we are according to my clock readings especially the the more sensitive clock 
it's been on a general downtrend we had a bit of a bounce up today but I would expect this to continue down I'll know that in a couple of days uh, but this um, cube clock that I've got is actually turning out to be a very good indicator of uh, the earth charge levels okay so pay attention to where alanine is so it's slightly uh, lower than horizontal so we'll speed the time up a bit and we'll move on so as we come around and we hit this uh, alanine alignment the actual alignment will occur on September 1st I don't think we'll see anything earlier than that I think it'll actually be September 1st where you'll see this uh, in some sort of event because we're going to be in alignment with the, the head of the comet and perhaps a comma okay so as far as uh, when do we next come into alignment with the tail well that's actually not going to be until September 10 so prior to that we're going to have let's go down to the earth and I'll show you where we discharge after this charge up event with the alignment with uh, with Elenin okay so we pass that alignment and as you'll see if we go to the moon we start to get into alignment with Jupiter okay now we're looking at the Earth from the perspective of the Moon and we're looking at the approaching alignment to Jupiter as you can see the alignment occurs on September 2nd and it should occur at about uh, 12 midday UTC time okay that'll be about the alignment so let's give ourselves a two-hour window uh, a one hour window is not enough as I discovered last time so we'll call it between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. will be a significant earthquake magnitude 7 plus let's have a look to see what we had previously on that alignment and on the last Jupiter alignment which was on August 20 okay it was a 7.2 in Vanuatu followed by 7.1 in fact I think they've increased these I think they were calling this a 7.0 so they've bumped it back up again so that was the, the two major earthquakes that actually occurred on that day. We had a 7.2 followed by a 7.1. And that was on the Jupiter alignment. In fact, we can check that. I'll show you how close it was. Um, just to give you an example of how close these alignments occur. This is at 1655. Okay, so this is there's a little bit of proof here that uh, these alignments are true and accurate. Okay, so let's go to August 20 and check out what the alignment was. And as you can see, the exact alignment was actually on August 20 at 9.53 a.m. In fact, a little bit earlier than that, I think. The exact alignment was probably at, uh, at 9 a.m. or 9.30 a.m. And as you can see, the earthquake occurred in Vanuatu, the peak or the biggest earthquake on the day, occurred at 1655 so that's within eight hours of the exact alignment okay so this is the sort of accuracy we're looking at with these these sorts of um, charts and these sorts of uh, concepts that I'm trying to share with you here okay so that was the earthquake that occurred on this alignment here I'll get rid of the alanine of the chart so you can see it more clearly okay this is the alignment we're looking at August 20 a seven point two and a seven point zero. Oh. The biggest earthquake occurred within eight hours of the alignment. So um, that gives you an idea and I believe I had actually already predicted that something was going to occur on that date in advance. I didn't give you the exact time but we can go back to Celestia and you can see the time that the exact alignment occurred and that the earthquake actually occurred within eight hours of that time. So the next alignment that comes after Jupiter is of course this which I'm now going to call the unknown object, whatever that object is out there. And that was August 22nd. And of course we did have earthquakes on that day. Uh, we can probably have a quick look to see what they were. We had the 6.0 southwest of Sumatra. Okay, so let's just quickly run through the other alignments. Of course we had the 24th, the most recent one, which was in Peru. Okay, and that of course occurred slightly early. So they're not all late, sometimes they occur earlier. Okay, so we had this big Earth charging up event, and that began on August 22nd. And it peaked on August 24th, the discharge event. That was the earthquake. And this charge up event occurred with a parallel alignment between the Earth and Moon and the comet's tail. 
even though the comet's a long way away from us, the Earth-Moon system was parallel to the comet's tail and the Earth-Moon system charged. And that caused a slowdown in the clocks as the crystals, as the quartz crystals expanded with the charge that was everywhere. And I observed that in uh, switches on my computer going off randomly uh, as if waves of energy were passing over it or it was like having a poltergeist, a ghost in the machine. Well, no, it was, the Earth was highly charged. Some of that was discharged on the 23rd with the Virginia earthquake, um, but that was not a big discharge. The big discharge actually happened on the 24th, pretty much exactly on schedule. And as you can see here, we'll go to the 24th. And we'll see the alignment that was that discharge event. It's going to the dead star, the black sun, whatever you like to call it. Okay, August 24, big discharge. Not as big as the Jupiter discharge, but still a big discharge. 7.0 earthquake. A 7.0 in Peru, followed by a 6.2 in Vanuatu. So we'll look at both of those actually, but. Let's have a look at uh, the Peruvian earthquake first. So the exact time of that earthquake was 1746. So let's see on Celestia, where was the moon at 1746? Okay, 1746, or 5.45 is it showing up here, p.m. Uh, it's slightly before where I picked it. I was actually picking it on this line because this is a line that uh, correlates with a lot of big earthquakes so this is the most likely position for it to occur on. It actually occurred 15 minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, it occurred at 15, uh, 1745. I was saying between 6 and 7 which was actually put the moon about here somewhere. So, but I can live with that. And of course we had the Vanuatu earthquake and that occurred at uh, 2306. So let's check 2306. And you'll find the moon is on the other side of, of that al exact alignment. And this is the alignment. Okay, so this is where the moon was for the Vanuatu earthquake. 6.2, I believe it was. Okay. So, again, these earthquakes occurred on schedule where they were supposed to have happened. On the dates and almost exactly the times that they as should occur. I mean, I've looked at a lot of these, I've looked at hundreds of these things. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with when these things occur. Earthquakes don't always happen in these alignments, and that's the, the trick. I took me a long time to solve that. And I, thanks to Comet Allen and thanks to uh, Associated Press and their disinformation article, the penny dropped, and I've actually finally solved it. As a result of the disinformation article released by the Associated Press, I started my clock experiment. Uh, as a result of the clock experiment, I became aware that clocks were slowing down and finally put it together that the clock slowdown is to do with a charging event on the planet. And not only that, this charging event occurs when the Earth and Moon are in parallel alignment to a comet's tail. So let's have a look at some other examples and why don't we look at 2004 see what was happening there. As you remember, December 26, 2004, at I think it was 058 AM, what happened? We had one of the biggest earthquakes in recent history. Let's have a look. We look at the old historical data. Significant earthquakes. 2004. I'll get the exact time of this. A 9.1, everyone who you're looking at, it's called a 9.1, 9.2, some call it a 9.3. It was huge. I believe the Japan earthquake actually might have been larger than this, but uh, this was huge. Okay, at uh, 058, 059, and as you can see, for the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami earthquake, the moon was about here and not here. I'll just drag it up. As you see, that's Orion again and the earthquake appears to have occurred 12 hours early. I'll just uh, let it run and you can see this is about 12 hours. So 
that's where you normally expect it to have occurred but um, this one went off early and there could be a reason for that and one reason could be that there was just so much energy stored up that uh, the alignment was close enough that the discharge of energy occurred if you can imagine a cosmic spark was released uh, because there's just so much energy it was released before the perfect alignment okay so what could have been the cause of that well let's have a look so let's zoom out from the earth and what we're looking for are comets of course alanine's out here okay we can eliminate alanine because the tail's pointing the wrong way the tail has to be pointing practically up and straight up and down in this image here Haley, no the tail's pointing the wrong way or rally that's a possibility hale bop akia jung i'd eliminate these two because prior to the discharge of energy the tail must be on this angle here these would be wrong let's check out to see if Borelli is in the picture at all so when we click on Borelli we see there's actually a short period comet it's not going to have any charge essentially it's uh, out at the level of Jupiter it's out around near Jupiter at this moment and it's not it's going to be at a level of charge lower than the earth so Borelli no we can eliminate Borelli so let's do a Google search for comets on December 2004 and the top of the list comes up Comet Mac Holes, December 17, 2004. Okay, so I've already found some useful links here. And this particular one is NASA Science, and they've got some pictures of this comet. And what do you see here? None other than the Pleiades. Well, that's very interesting. What date was that? January 7. Okay, so our big earthquake occurred on December 26. And there's actually another one that occurred before that, and that was on December 23. It was an 8.2 in the Macquarie Islands. I know the Macquarie Island earthquake occurred just before the Pleiades alignment. And we know that the uh, Sumatra earthquake occurred just before the Orion alignment. And we've got the comet right here on January 7. So let's see if we can find anything else about this comet. Is it a long period comet, for example? Here's another image coming from Wikipedia and as you can see it's just beside the Pleiades again and here's another image and on this one it says at midnight January 7th and 8th okay so this looks more accurate January 7th and 8th it was just below the Pleiades so we're talking about two weeks here this comet two weeks prior to this where was it? Well, let's find some more information about this comet now let's have a look what uh, NASA actually had to say about it it's called the Green Comet so comets come in all colors and this one is aquamarine green the comet is at least three times wider than Jupiter yet the comet itself is tiny and this one is probably no more than a few kilometers wide oh that would, sounds like a very wimpy uh, comet a minuscule nugget hidden deep inside its own atmosphere okay so here's a chart from spaceweather.com and it shows where the comet was projected to be on January 2005 Okay, so on January 2nd, it was about the level of Aldebaran, and then you could, if you count back, you could imagine it'd be somewhere down the level of Orion, so just below the ecliptic. Okay, so let's have a look at that. So on the JPL website, I found the orbit diagram for Comet McHoles, and as you can see here, it's very close to the Earth, and we can tip it over, we can see that it's actually this is a long period comet coming in uh, from below the plane of the solar system. If we zoom out a bit you can see it's a long period comet. It came in from a, a long way out and the alignment is very similar to what we have showing here for Celestia on the same date. So as we step through this let's go look at this from the Earth's perspective. Zoom in a bit. So let's step through from December 23rd and December 24th and we pretty much maintain that alignment here and the tail will have been in this direction so before the 26th the moon actually passed through a very close alignment to that as you can see the moon passes around and ultimately the moon ends up in the direction of Orion where most discharge events occurred and we have big earthquakes okay so the situation with big holes is very similar to what happened uh, with Alanin prior to March 11 of this year it's a long period comet 
and as it's approaching it's drawing charge from the sun and the sun is streaming energy down towards the comet in this case the earth and moon are in parallel alignment to this stream of energy so even though we're the tail would be coming out this way is actually the energy stream here going from the sun to the comet and the energy that is charging up the earth is actually coming from the sun it's not coming from the comet so ultimately the earth charged up with so much energy that it had to release it and it was released on the Orion alignment when the moon swung around to the direction of Orion so exactly how much energy was released at the moment of the earthquake in Sumatra on this Orion alignment or at Wikipedia and they listed as a magnitude 9.2 on the Richter scale which is equivalent of 950 megatons of TNT that's almost 1 billion tons of TNT put that into perspective Little Boy, the bomb that uh, the Americans dropped on the Japanese on Hiroshima in 1945 the energy release was between 13 and 18 kilotons of TNT so the amount of energy released on the Sumatra earthquake was the equivalent of 63,000 nuclear bombs. Let's add the sun element alignment to our chart. Okay, okay, there's a good reason why the peaks occurred on these dates, and I can quickly explain what's going on here. Let's zoom in. On February 27, not only did we have the alignment with Comet Alanin. We also had the alignment with Jupiter. The energy for this earthquake didn't come from Alanin itself, it came from the Sun. We passed through the Sun Alanin alignment, and during that alignment, we were struck by the flow of energy passing from the Sun to Alanin to the edge of the solar system, to wherever Alanin had come from. That energy flow passed through the earth we were charged up and we were in that energy flow and we know we discharged Jupiter so we would have been coursing energy and grounding it at the same time even without the Jupiter alignment I'm sure we would have actually had a big earthquake on that date so let's have a look at uh, the alignment for the Christchurch earthquake and what was the date of the Christchurch earthquake let's pull that up 2010 September 3rd, 1635 UTC. Let's have a look. So where was the moon at this point? As you can see, we have just passed the same alignment again, as I've talked about before. And this is the dead star alignment. Okay, so remember the earthquake in Peru on August 24, and the alignment that I was suggesting for that earthquake well this is what it's based on I see this alignment over again and again and again okay so it's not surprising that we had a discharge event on this alignment and what was the charge event for it where was element so we'll go above the earth and get a top-down view Where was Alanin? Well, she's right here. Now, if we go to Alanin, let's have a look at where she's pointing. Alanin is heading towards the sun, and the Earth is right behind the sun. The sun, not Alan. Alanin is what caused the sun to drop its energy onto us. And as you can see, there's the moon. Earth, moon. This alignment, this is no joke. This alignment happens again and again and again, and it happens for a reason because there is a massive object out there. And we can see it in the earthquakes. We can see it in the sea levels. This is no joke. This is most likely the center of our real 
solar system, which probably should we call our binary system. This is the center of our binary system. Okay, if I'm talking about the center of our binary system, and I don't know if we're coming up to perihelion, but I suspect we are. Okay, I think that is really what 2012 might be about. However, in Virgo, around here somewhere, and you have to look it up on Google Sky, and I haven't got it ready, but is there is Planet X. Planet X is actually coming in on Virgo and there's an interesting story that came up about that which I'll drop into this as well. Okay, so let's go back and have a look. Exploding star coming to a telescope near you. Over the next few days those of us in the northern hemisphere will have a rare chance to watch a star explode. Hopefully via nothing more than a small telescope. What are they talking about? Well, they're talking about supposedly an explosion taking place 25 million light years from Earth in a spiral galaxy called the Pinwheel, also known as M101. So let's get Stellarium up and look for the Pinwheel. Let's do a quick search. Now, if you do M101, you're taken to here. Okay, so I'll get rid of the Earth, the ground, and we'll get equatorial mount set. Okay, and we'll put on the constellations. Put on the constellations. Okay, well, and we it zoom out a bit, zoom in a bit. What is a pinwheel? This is the pinwheel. This is called the pinwheel galaxy. Okay, this is a pinwheel galaxy. Here's another story about it. The telegraph, exploding star to be visible from Earth within a fortnight. The most visible exploding star in a generation will be visible in the skies above Britain within a fortnight. Oxford University astronomers have announced. Okay. The rare Type 1a supernova, an event where a star explodes, then sucks up the energy from another nearby star and is reborn, happened in the Pinwheel Galaxy located in the Great Bear Constellation. So let's look that up. Let's, let's pull up the constellations and see what it is. Is this the Great Bear Constellation? Wow, look at that. It's the tail of a bear. What does the M stand for in M101? That could be interesting. Let's find that out. Pinwheel Galaxy, Miser 101. Miser. Sound familiar? Miser. Yeah, it does. Remember the scene at the beginning of Deep Impact? Ask me. It's really nice. Yeah, to you, maybe. You guys getting some good work done over here? Yeah, yeah, sounds like it. What's the bright one? Uh, Mizar. It's a double star. Good. The one next to it? Uh, Alcor. Good, Biederman. And the one next to that? Uh, I don't know. Mizar. Mizar. Mizar and Alcor. And what's that object next to it? That bright object next to it. 